So I'll go through I'll go through the last three point bending example so you see how the deflection comes from that, uh, how it gets derived out, and then go through the beam bending lab. So the beam bending lab is my our plan is of course to be much more analysis heavy. Uh, so it's it's a lab write up, not a formal report. Uh, <coughs> It'll be there'll be a little bit more theoretical, a few more theoretical calculations on it that you need to do because basically you, I'll show you in a little bit, but there there's, it involves a lot of strain gauges and transformations and uh, <coughs> stress stress strain transformations, um, and so there'll be a little bit more back end calculations on your part. So we're expecting less thorough of a discussion and more uh, just results and analysis uh, for calculating what the theoretical value should be. So. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Cool. So for now, let's talk about beam stuff. So last week I had shown for beam bending we had if we have some beam with some boundary conditions um, and some arbitrary load on it Q of X this beam if it's slender enough we can pretend it's a one-dimensional structure and what we want to know is the deflection down of this neutral axis do, do, do. this deflection down we're gonna call W of X where X is the axis along the beam and we had shown I had shown there was one major equation that defines all of this, and it's um, EI. Da, 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 if I can actually pull it up one over EI d to the fourth W dx to the fourth is equal to Q of x. <laughs> so this is the one ODE that defines for Euler Bernoulli beams, defines their deflection. Um, and so you can take this ODE, solve the general form. This Q of X is, is a general load on the outside, uh, which we won't actually be doing at all here. I just wanted to show it for the sake of completeness of this thing. Um, but what you can find in the end uh, is that there's some deflection W of X is equal to, uh, what is that, EI. Da, 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 da. Why is this mixed up? Because this is not 1 over EI. Oh, yeah. I was about to say, where's the 1 over Yes. EI. 1 over pops in on the other side. EI. Here's the 1 over EI. Um, 1 sixth C1 X cubed. C2 X squared. C3 C3 x c4 plus the fourth integral of q of x dx so once you have if you start with this ode you basically need to find general boundary conditions for what this beam is i had shown the this cantilever beam example last week um, and then you can figure out what the deflection of your beam is going to be uh, along with this there's a couple of relations that are important. The bending moment, bending moment M is equal to negative one over EIW. Uh, let me make sure that all these are correct. I'm not telling you wrong things. Da, 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 da. So if I even have it in my notes anywhere. One over uh, EI. W double prime of x, uh, Q one over E I W triple prime of x. Um, so this bending moment relates to your deflection, and this shear. This is a shear force here relates to your bending moment, based on these relationships. I'm probably just mixing all these up now. <coughs> yes. It is negative EI. Uh, 
Uh, just all of those over. This is what happens when you take too long of a break from the material. Um, okay, so you can also find these generally from a force balance, uh, force balance moment balance. So if you remember that cantilever beam that we had before, da, 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 um, I have some force P acting downward on it. If I were to cut open this beam, uh, so this is now, we're going to define this is our positive x direction, this is our positive z direction, um, sometimes this is a positive y, it's, I'm, I'm just using z here because that's what I like to do. Um, here now if we, if we cut this apart uh, at the back end of the beam, to balance that out there's some reaction force P uh, that's going upward to balance it out. So if I were to kind of take a slice out of this beam, I get some P there and then some moment M to balance it out. Uh, P. And so the P here is a constant through the beam because there's no other point where this P is changing, um, where there's no other point where the force on the beam is changing because it's a point load. Uh, then the moment changes based on the length at the root. You can say for a beam of length L, for a beam of length L, the reaction moment is PL. Um, so M equals PL at the root and there's a free boundary condition at the end, so m equals zero at this end. Um, and in our derivation, that kind of came up with as a, as a boundary condition. So here we have a, a w double prime at the end is zero, because there's zero moment. Um, the, then the displacement and the deflection at this, this, at this end is zero, because it's fixed. Um, yeah, cool. So. Uh, I'm going to walk through now a three-point bending example, which is basically what you'll be doing for your lab. So, three-point bending example. Three-point bending. So, three-point bending, we're going to generally set up beam like this, some length L here, a point load P in the center of the beam. On one side we'll have a fixed boundary condition, on the other side we'll have a roller boundary condition. Uh, this is because even though the neutral axis of the beam we're assuming isn't deflecting in the X or Y, um, remember that here the plane sections of the beam remain plane, which means that when I take this beam from one state to the other, let's just draw some lines this way, uh, oh, let's do this. There we go. Even though th we're assuming here the neutral axis of the beam, the center part that isn't experiencing any force or any stress uh, is not extending or contracting in the X or Y, but these plane sections here remain plane, which means that they deflect out if they start at 90 degrees, which I didn't draw them at 90 degrees, but if they start at 90 degrees here, then they end at 90 degrees once it's being deflected. So that means here the ends of the beam are actually rotating slightly as it's being deformed. Um, so remember that this the plane sections remain plane is, is our big euler bernoulli <coughs> beam engine. This is not true for a short stubby beam, in which case other theories can come into play, like Timoshenko beam theory, um, and you can use that instead. So now, for our Euler Bernoulli beam, or for our for our three-point bending beam, I am going to redraw this 
now as two point force here with a point force here. This is P uh, to react this P uh, because this P is in the center of the beam. These are both going to be equal P over two. So what this means now is our Q of X. If I were to just, uh, if I were to draw a cut line in here, the, the there has to be a P downward, which X Z. So if I were to draw a cut line here, there has to be a P downward in the positive Z direction to counteract the P over two. Then when I get to the mid plane, all of a sudden there's now, so at this point, let's draw a short beam. Uh, there has to be a P over two to counteract this part of the beam, uh, or to counteract this reaction force from the end. But if I take it at a slightly further point away, uh, P over two, P, uh, all of a sudden that Q switches to a P over two in the other direction to counteract this point load. We're assuming that point load is just acting vertically through the beam. So what this Q, oh, what this Q will now look like, what our, what our shear force, it's going to be a piecewise function that is uh, P over two between zero uh, to L over two, if this is acting halfway through the beam, which I'm gonna mark L over two. Um, so it's, it's P over two up to the midpoint of the beam and then negative P over two from L over two is less than less than x is less than l. So now, because of the way we're idealizing this, there's we're just going to have two points, uh, or two, two halves of the beam where this thing is acting. So now, <coughs> our boundary conditions, uh, we need to take into account this part of the function, uh, this part of the beam and this part of the beam. So we have uh, the deflection up to the mid, up to the middle, up to the end, because now there's there's two different sections of this. So our boundary conditions, because this is a pinned condition here at the end, a pinned but fixed, and this is a roller condition, um, both of the deflections, W at zero is equal to zero. Uh, the, because it's a free boundary condition here, the second derivative uh, is equal to zero, so the moment is equal to zero. The, at the other end, W of L is equal to zero, because again, we have a fixed displacement here. Uh, w double prime at L is also equal to zero, because again, we have a free boundary here. And then we also know the W, there's now for the middle, because it's symmetric, we can say the slope of this thing, the slope at L over two is going to be zero. So the slope at the midplane is zero because that's, we're just going to assume that this is a symmetric deflection. And then importantly, uh, W at L over two from one side is equal to W at L over two from the other side. So, yeah. Here we go. Sorry. Um, so W. Let's see. Do that. Does that work? That works. Cool. Um, <clears throat> right. So because we have a piecewise function, we need to figure out the functions on both sides of this thing. On one side, uh, or the deflection on this side has to be equal to the deflection at the other side. Um, Actually, so does this derivative. So the the derivative here, w prime at L over two uh, from the right is equal to the one on the left. It's just both of them are zero, so this is an easier boundary condition to write. Uh, da, da, da. Where does it go? Okay, so when you have that, <coughs> there's 
you can kind of take these, plug them all into our into our C1. There we go. So uh, here now, ge generally, we're going to ignore this Q because we're not going to have any continuous function along the top side. But you can take this function, plug in those boundary conditions that you have, um, figure out values for C1, C2, C3, C4, uh, which is a little bit tedious, so I'm not actually going to go through it uh, here. But what you end up with is something like W of x. is px over 48 ei ei l squared minus 4x squared from the right side p over 48 ei 4x cubed 12 l x squared uh, nine x l l cubed. Okay. Um, importantly, the there's there's a couple things that you need to know are that so this is this is the general formula for the deflection, um, which you should be able to take in an experiment if you if you took a, basically a picture of a beam being deflected, you should see this general cubic. Uh, Dis displacement shape of the beam in a three-point bend test. Um, but the most important quantity is what you'll be measuring for the beam lab and what you need to know in general for beam bending are the maximum moment and maximum displacement, uh, which in this case happen in the center of the beam. <coughs> so these are W max. Uh, I'll do this. Sure. Uh, w max is the displacement at L over 2, which if we plugged all of those quantities into there, we would get E L cubed over 48 E I. Uh, and the maximum moment is also the moment at L over 2, which is P L over 4. So these two are the important quantities that pop out of here. Um, yeah. For the, the W of X piece wise, is that for zero to X to L over two for the top one? Yes. It's the same the then same zero to X uh, zero to L over two and L over two to L. I just ran out of room and I'm not going to write them there. Um, so Last week we should have also talked about stresses, or hmm, I won't talk about stresses. But, um, okay, so I'm going to jump into the three-point bending, or the, the three-point bending, the lab now. Uh, but first, I wanted to ask, or I wanted to go through a quick conceptual question. So. I'm going to do this guy. Oh, it would help if I plug things in. So the question is going to be, when you bend a beam, when it goes from in a three-point bending test or a four-point bending, generally when it's deflected downward, uh, you know that there's going to be 
here, compressive stress on the top of the beam and the tensile stress on the bottom. What, but we're kind of ignoring before in the deflection relationships what the shape of the beam is that it takes on. Um, it turns out for your lab, this is actually an important consideration to make. So I wanted to ask here, what's going to be the shape of the cross section? If we start off with a rectangular cross section, what's going to be the shape that it takes on when you bend it? Is it going to stay rectangular or is it going to transform into one of these other <coughs> cross sections? Did you shut up my answer because my phone doesn't want to be cold? I, sure. Oh. I'm guessing. I'll give you maybe 30 more seconds to plug in an answer or change an answer. Okay, so this, this is good. There's, there's a fair amount of disagreement. Um, some people have the correct answer, some people do not. They, lots of people do not. Definitely um, not four. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's talk about it a little bit and see if we can't figure out what it might be. So I'm going to jump back to the document camera. It's like diamond of three. It's two. If it actually switches back to my doc cam. All right. Let's just say. There we go. Okay. So now, when we take that beam and we bend it, do do do. Oh, this is a horribly drawn beam. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's got a bit of a taper to it. Yeah, just just ignore. Oh. That's, I don't know if that made it any better. Um, so remember, remember our stress uh, is equal to my over i, where y is now the distance from the neutral axis here of our beam, um, or mz, I guess, in the convention that I'm using, and z over i, we're here, z is equal to zero. Um, on the top side of the beam, now there's a compressive pressure, and on the bottom side, there's a tension. Um, here now we can say the moment, the maximum moment in the center of the beam is at PL over 4. Um, but now what do we know? Let's, let's go back to, let's go back to a, a uniaxial beam or a uniaxial bar in tension. So if I apply a P here to the bar, we know if this has a cross-sectional area A, my stress is going to be P over A. Uh, my epsilon is going to be sigma over E 
sigma x, let's define this as the x direction, as the y direction, epsilon x. But now, what is my epsilon y going to be? Right. Some, some, some formula with Poisson's ratio. But conceptually, is, is the beam going to expand or contract when I pull on it? I'm pulling on it. It's getting smaller, right? So this is from our definition of Poisson's ratio, negative nu E x, or negative nu sigma x over E. <coughs> So now, when, I, when I'm pulling on this thing in tension, this is actually starting to contract. Um, what's happening here now, remember we have a tensile force on one side and a compressive, compressive, a tensile stress on one side and a compressive stress on the other side. So what do you think might happen with the bottom side of the beam here? Yeah, it's going to be tensing. What is going to happen then with the top side of the beam in compression? Yeah, bow out. And remember now, because this stress is linear through this thing, so in, in the elastic regime, the stress mz over i, z is linear, so it varies linearly throughout the height. So let's draw this. Um, if I have now sigma and z, uh, there's some compressive force on the top side. Some, I uh, can't even draw it through the center. Nah, there we go. That's to the center. Remember, we have some positive, uh, some compressive um, compression and tension here, and we're assuming it's varying linearly through the beam. So in the neutral axis of the beam, nothing is going to happen. Here, if it's in compression, what's going to happen? I'm just asking the same question again. Right. So if I compress it, then it's going to expand in the opposite direction. So in the through direction here of the beam, it's getting compressed along the beam axis. So in the through direction of the beam, it's going to then expand here, this is getting tensed along the beam axis, um, and so it's going to contract. So now, if we go back to this guy. Hey, 19 <laughs> to 31. What would the cross section of the beam be? Jump back to you. So which, which of these shapes is it going to take on? Right. <laughs> okay. Cool. So, uh, don't don't feel the need to change your answer. You're you're getting credit based on participation for this, um, or extra credit based on participation. Okay. So, this is an important consideration that you'll actually have to make in the beam bending lab. So, let's actually talk about it. Uh, I want to do. I'm going to escape this. Actually, I'm going to jump back to my laptop and go to here. Beam bending lab. If it wants to go. This thing. Sometimes. HDMI. I'm going to HDMI. Nothing there. Oh, come on. Let's see. Go to that. Two seconds ago. <laughs> 
There we go. Jesus. Okay. So, for the beam bending lab, I know, it's beautiful. So this one, there's actually very little setup that you have to do. Uh, experimentally, this is pretty much all ready to go for you. So what you'll have, there's two, bin, two beam bending configurations. There's a three point and a four point bend. This is a picture of the three point bending configuration. Um, there's the pin condition here at the end. Uh, so this is going through the neutral axis of the beam. So uh, it's able to kind of rotate around that freely. Here at the other side, there's a loading cell. Uh, remember now when we are, so here now in the, in the center, there's uh, what, something called the turn buckle. Mm -hmm. So a little thing that you spin, it's threaded opposite. So when you turn it, it pulls <coughs> it one way. Um, all you're going to be doing is, is turning this turn buckle and applying a force here to the center of the beam. Uh, when you turn it, you'll be measuring the force here at the end of the beam. Remember that that's half of the load that you're applying in the center of the beam. Uh, and now, importantly, what you're going to be doing to, to compare theory to experiments is there's four strain rosettes along the sides of the beam. So strain gauge rosettes. So here, this is a, a schematic. There's a, a point load P that you're going to be applying to the center of the beam. Uh, of length L, X and Z coordinates with our turnbuckle, load cell. Um, in the center of the beam, there's two strain gauge rosettes, one on the top, one on the bottom of the beam. Uh, so I'll talk about strain gauge rosettes in a sec, um, or what a strain gauge is. Here at this G2, there's some, uh, there's a strain gauge here at G2, uh, slightly away from the central axis, but or slightly away from the middle, but along the neutral axis of the beam. And then there's another strain gauge over here at a distance further away, G4. Um, those should be more or less the same between now our three point and four point bending. So four point, um, you have, instead of just a point load in the center, you have two loads on the side. You're still applying some P here in the middle, but you end up with a P over two on both of these and a reaction P over two here. Uh, you could come up with a deflection equation for this too, the full formula, it gets kind of gross. Um, but uh, you basically won't have to do anything in terms of setting this up. It's pretty much all ready to go. Should be all plugged in, all the strain gauges plugged in, everything glued up. You should just have to turn this turnbuckle and record distances, record lengths, um, and record strain gauge readings as you're deforming it. So uh, there's some theory in here some Q's, some M's, maximum deflections, uh, and I'll go through those in a second, uh, and then stress-strain relationship between shear force. Uh, if you remember, I told you you can ignore it generally. Uh, for the beam bending lab, this is a thing you'll be needing to, to consider. So what the shear vertically or, or laterally in the beam is, um, and then what the stress is due to the moment in the beam. Uh, so you'll be, that's, that's pretty much the whole setup. There's uh, numbers on these things indicated. So strain gauges one, two, three, four, or strain gauge rosettes, one, two, three, four. Each of these strain gauge rosettes has three strain gauges oriented at zero, 45, 90. So this is where your stress transformation equations come in. You'll basically need to figure out, you'll get a strain reading from each of these gauges so the strain along the zero, along the 45, along the 90, you'll need to use a transformation equation to figure out um, what the stress general state is, and then, or what the, what the general strain state is, compare that to the stress state then that you would expect from beam bending. Um, yeah, and so this, this lab is going to be much more analysis heavy than discussion heavy. Most of the discussion will be just talk about the error, talk about how and why your, your measured values differ from your theoretical values, uh, because there will be a bit of numerical calculation behind this and theoretical derivations. Um, but this time you have two weeks, so hopefully it's a little bit not as uh, stressful. Uh, okay, so, oh, we're also giving you two data sheets here at the end. 
where you can record all of these values for distances um, and strain gauge readings. So let's talk about some of the theory behind this. If it wants to... This thing kills me. How's it, how's it that it just works one second and it says it's not working one second? There we go. Cool. It seems so dark. Okay. So now, uh, we have our two different beam bending configurations, three-point and four-point bending. From an engineering standpoint, these are pretty much the standard tests that you do. Uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to each one, but for testing lots of different types of materials, especially brittle materials, this is a very fast, easy, and straightforward test to do that's generally pretty easy to analyze. You can do it with an Instron. All you need is, is two pegs and a, and a bar and a loading a wedge, and then you can do this test. So it's, it's very straightforward and simple to do, um, and it's, it's still used quite a lot in, in industry. Uh, so three-point and four-point bending, three point and four point bending. We just saw the setup for the three point bend test and how we get deflections out of that. I'm gonna call this some load P over two, P, P over two with some length L uh, and the load being applied, let's move this L slightly to the side, L, and the load being applied at the mid plane L over 2. Um, you remember that I had given you a, a piecewise equation for your Q before. I'm going to now plot these out because I think that's a nice way to represent these. Um, so now with our uh, x-axis going out and a z-axis going down. <coughs> I'm going to designate down as positive q here. Um, we start off with a positive p over 2 when we hit this midplane. We're assuming it kind of jumps up now to a negative p over 2, positive p over 2. Let's move this q so it's slightly easier to see. Um, q. So here now there's there's some piecewise on one side you'll have a, a, a positive shear and on the other side you'll have a negative shear. Uh, in terms of actually measuring this thing it doesn't make too much of a difference. Oh, how am I already out of time? Uh, there's a bending moment now um, that looks something like this. Um, uh, where here, this is our PL over 4. Um, and this is our X, our X. So M is again piecewise. Um, and there's just where that thing changes shape. Uh, M is sort of the integral of Q here, um, and it just changes angle there. Uh, then our deflection W, X, is going down. W is now going to be some cubic parabola shape uh, with the minimum at, uh, at our L over 2 where this w, uh, w max is that uh, p, p l cubed over 48 e i. Oh, I can draw this. OK, so that's our three-point bending configuration. Q, we have positive on one side, negative on the other, bending moment. Um, and then our W. So now your strain gauges, basically there's one in the center. You'll need to take um, from your strain gauge, sigma equals 
mz over i, uh, where i is bh cubed over 12 for a rectangular beam cross section with width b and height h. Um, and z is then the distance from the neutral axis. So remember, you'll have one set of strain gauges on the top, one set of strain gauges on the bottom. Um, then now for our four point bending, uh, maybe just have just enough time to talk about it. Uh, four point bending, the idea is, again, I have two reaction forces, or two supports here on the end, um, and then two point forces being applied downward over 2, P over 2, uh, where this is applied at a distance A away from the sides, and this whole beam is length L. Just lay it down just the stage. Yep. Um, P over 2, P over 2, A. Um, and some distance L. Now our Q looks a little bit odd. Um, it'll be a positive P over 2 up to the A value, at which point it'll jump down to 0. It's actually 0 across this whole range and then jumps up to negative um, P over 2 when you get to this positive A. The advantage now for our moment is inside this regime, inside A, you have some moment increasing up in the whole center of the gauge. Um, you, the M is actually a constant. Um, and so this M constant now is something PA over 2. Do, do, do. This is our PA over 2, um, which oh. if A is L over 2, we end up back our original formula. And then W is, again, some quadratic or cubic deflection um, that has a formula W um, max at the center is equal to uh, P A over 48 E I 3 L squared minus 4 A squared. Um, these equations should all be written out in your lab notebook or lab uh, lab manual, but um, and we'll talk a little bit about more a little bit more about strain gauges, how strain gauges work on Friday, and then do a midterm review. Uh, Sirwin has all of your labs now, right?